Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to explore dark matter and dark energy. With me is Dr. Vernon Neppe, who is the author of Reality Begins with Consciousness, a book he wrote with physicist Edward Close. He is a neuropsychiatrist and also a specialist in what he calls dimensional biopsychophysics. He has authored over 700 scientific papers. Welcome, Vernon. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, these days in cosmology and astronomy, uh, dark matter uh, constitutes uh, a huge percentage of uh, what is believed to exist in, in our observable universe. That is true. Um, there have been several probes called the Planck probes are going all the way through potentially to 2014, and no doubt they're still considering these things, uh, doing probes in terms of kinds of microwave components mm -hmm. in terms of the universe. And the latest figures are dark matter and dark energy constitute 95.1% of our whole cosmos. And, and yet, uh, nobody has ever uh, looked at it under a microscope. They, they don't really know w what it is or, or where it is. is. Is that correct? Yes. And they cannot look at it under a microscope because if they did, I suppose they wouldn't be saying it's dark. You know, there's no <laughs> light component yeah. in relation to this. Mm -hmm. And so we know that of that 95-odd percent, that may be about 68% is dark energy, and about 27% then would be dark matter. And they actually are not together. They are quite separate. Mm -hmm. And uh, the notion is that uh, this amount of mass is is required, or uh, well, energy and matter are convertible to each other, but ultimately could be expressed in mass. That th This mass is, is necessary or... Uh, the universe would be expanding way too rapidly, much more rapidly than it is thought to be expanding now. Or presumably contracting too rapidly. Uh -huh. So this is the whole basis of yeah. much of our research in a different direction somewhat, mm -hmm. and then stumbling upon these cosmological components. The basis of our universe, of cosmology, of quantum physics, of our macrophysics is stability. You've got to have stable atoms, you've got to have stable particles, and if they're not stable and very often symmetric, boom, mm -hmm. we would have a universe that would fly apart in moments. Well, I know in, in the subatomic realm, you have particles that last maybe a millionth of a second or something. They're very unstable. Um, but I'm not aware that uh, subatomic physicists, uh, in their thinking, require that there be dark matter. Well, this is the whole point. It's became a mystery. Why is it there? Let's ignore it. But it doesn't quite fit our model, mm -hmm. and this has been a problem that we've seen in quantum physics, uh, particularly where we sometimes use the phrase weirdness, and we've yep. just got to accept that weirdness right. in quantum physics, and there are reasons for that weirdness. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that's controversial. Uh, a lot of physicists uh, don't want there to be weirdness in physics. I, I remember years ago, I interviewed Murray Gelman, and uh, I, he, I, he sent me 
e an advanced copy, a pre-publication copy of his book. It talked about physics is weird, but in, in the book, uh, The Jaguar and the Quark. And uh, then when the final edition was uh, published, he took it out. He said, any mention of weirdness was removed. I, I noticed that. So, so there are physicists who insist that uh, it's all like, rational, it's all explainable. And there are other physicists who say, I think Feynman was one who said that uh, if you don't think physics is weird, you don't understand it. Yeah, a very strange comment, but uh, certainly he would make the comment. And of course, Richard Feynman was the people's physicist. Yeah. Everyone would look towards him as mm -hmm. the guy who's saying mm -hmm. these important things and, well, just appreciate that you don't understand it. Yeah. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, my colleague, Dr. Edward Close, and I are not in that school of weirdness. Mm -hmm. We think it's explainable. In other words, you would say we live in a rational universe. We live in a universe that is governed by the laws of nature and by the same laws of nature, be it in the quantum universe or in the cosmological mm -hmm. and, of course, in our macro physical realm. Mm -hmm. And this is the key in terms of the discussion we're having today because hopefully I will be able to illustrate yeah. at a very lay level that Cosmology and dark matter and dark energy fit the same laws of physics mm -hmm. as does quantum so-called weirdness, yeah. except it's not weird. It's weird only because we're looking at our physical dimensions. Mm -hmm. Well, you and Dr. Close have come up with, with a model that we've discussed in a number of previous interviews, uh, TV, DDP. TDVP, yeah. yes. And, and uh, or your alternative, TDDVP, <laughs> because the one is dimensional yeah. distinction. Yeah. yeah. I, I have to admit, uh, I, uh, I've interviewed you now for hours and hours <laughs> of, of, about it, and I think you're on, onto some very important things, but I can't claim to discover it simply or to understand it. I can't claim to understand it, Vernon, because I don't have the background that you have in mathematics and in, in physics. Uh, so I'm operating on a certain level of trust here. <laughs> but what you're saying is that uh, you found a way to resolve the dark matter problem. Yes. So, so the first aspect to sort of take into account is the fact that we're not dealing with what just is our experience. Mm -hmm. Length, breadth, height, three dimensions of space in a moment in time, the present. That's called 3S1T, right. our physical reality. Mm -hmm. Once we understand that's our experience, as opposed to existence that we are having, mm -hmm. which is quantized, in other words, in little bits, in little pixels, yep. uh, little discrete components, and which is nine-dimensional, and it's not a speculation, it's a proof, and we've be, been able to prove this in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, a lot of these conundrums that we couldn't explain, and a lot of the weirdness goes away. And so the first principle here is talking about a nine-dimensional quantized finite reality, which incidentally is linked with an infinite continuity, but mm -hmm. let's leave out that infinite continuity today. Okay. So, nine dimensions, uh, everything is quantized, uh, so it's consistent with uh, Planck's universe and, and, and quantum physics. And I understand as well that uh, in your model, these nine dimensions are all spinning. Exactly that. They all are vortical, they all are rotating, they all are dynamic. Mm -hmm. And this creates a phenomenon called angular momentum. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine as you go higher and higher at this dimensional level, the spinning is more and more the distance between the center point and the outside, if you want, circumference, the outside horizons become larger and larger. So indeed, spinning, mm -hmm. vortical spin. 
is a key mm -hmm. in relation to this. And uh, the thing that puzzles me uh, intuitively is that I, I can conceive of a particle spinning, an atom spinning, a person spinning, but a dimension spinning is something completely different, isn't it? Yeah, the dimensions are not really spinning. The dimensions are measurable, but they have to measure something. Mm -hmm. They are extent, yeah. and they have to measure a content. Mm -hmm. And it's these subatomic particles which might actually turn out to be vortical physics, vortical atomic components. And the subatomic particles are what are spinning. Not the dimensions. Not the dimensions. They are spinning through dimensions, mm. within dimensions, okay. through from one to another. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting because just in relation to that spin, you start at that first dimension and you go to the ninth dimension. That's eight uh, dimensions. And, you know, you'll always hear about a lot of these particles having half spin. And the physicists will say, well, we don't really understand why we've got half spin or we've got one and a half spin or two thirds spin. If you think about half spin through eight rotations, first to the nine, you've got four full rotations. Mm -hmm. Even this model of triadic dimensional distinction vortical paradigm or TDVP solves the spin components. And this is something that is very, very relevant even in cosmology. Mm -hmm. We've spoken about expanding universe and rotations though all the way through. Yeah. You can see that this is the equivalent. Mm. Now, the dark matter that's missing in cosmology, you also postulate a substance uh, according to your model called Gimel, which uh, is also required in order to make the mathematics work. Exactly. When you start looking at basic things like protons, neutrons, and electrons, what we learned in high school and put together equals an atom, mathematically, and we've discussed this, it does not work. It does not work out because they all have to be integral or ones. Mm. Uh, at that level, in yeah. other words, units. We, and, we, and we have discussed this in right. a prior interview. And when we look at it in that way, we said, what's the matter with matter? The matter with matter was there had to be something else mm -hmm. that fitted in volumetrically yeah. and in terms of overall calculations of mass and energy. And people have spoken mm -hmm. about uh, even the Higgs boson mm -hmm. became famous as a consequence, the so-called God particle. The only trouble is it's really, really ephemeral. Mm -hmm. And he spoke about thousandths of a second. You're talking about absolute tiny, tiny quantities. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that and you spoke about Murray Girl Man mm -hmm. and he his gluons. Yes. And this was also a way to try and answer this component of volume. Mm -hmm. And it worked with protons and neutrons as glue and as some kind of a virtual particle. Mm -hmm. So what, what you're saying is that the gluons represent Murray Gelman's way of resolving this question of what keeps atoms from flying apart. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it did. The only problem was it didn't take into account the electron mm -hmm. and it didn't it take into account this nine-dimensional component. Mm -hmm. So the likelihood as we've seen it is these gluons don't exist. Our gimel does, and the gimel is what is providing stability because you can do calculations relating to gimel and work out exact amounts of gimel in every one of these subatomic particles yeah. uh, that Gelman spoke about quarks, mm -hmm. including the quarks mm -hmm. and the electrons. So all of this we take into account yeah. In cosmology. And Gimel, as we've discussed uh, previously, has no mass, but it has volume. And it has no energy as well. So it's massless and energyless. Mm -hmm. It has either volume or it has virtual volume, dynamic volume, if you want, that sets up 
these atoms as having the extra volume just as the gluons did, but they are not, Gimel is not mm -hmm. glue, it's busy rotating through nine dimensions. But that Gimel then has the same kind of hypothesis component as dark matter and dark energy. Now, this is a mystery to me because, as I understand it, dark matter and dark energy have mass and energy, and Gimel has neither. Yes, it might be so. Nobody's 100% sure what dark matter and dark energy do, except that we know that some have said, well, maybe uh, there are strong force, strong gravitational forces and weak gravitational forces, and the dark matter might be linked up with putting these all together, so strong forces, and the dark energy might be a weaker force. And you start saying, hold on, but doesn't this sound a little like the atom in terms of the protons and neutrons, the mm. so-called nucleons, with their dark forces together and the weaker forces in terms of the electron? You, you mean strong force and weak force? Yeah. Inside the nucleus. Yes. yes. And doesn't it sound a little bit like gravity? And people have spoken about the anti-gravity and almost the pro-gravity components there. And the question is, is this real energy and is it real mass or is it virtual energy and virtual mass in the sense that we were talking about the gluon yeah. and maybe the gimel. And this is something that is difficult to resolve. But, but let's slow down a minute because when you, you use the term virtual energy, virtual mass, that's an exciting concept. And I know it's used a lot in physics today, but it's hard to understand because Virtual particles are like they're, they're there, but they're not really there. Exactly. And this is what the work with, for example, the Large Hadron Collider mm -hmm. has shown. And incidentally, when we're talking about these particles and mm -hmm. we're talking about Gimel yeah. and we're talking about the whole atom, mm -hmm. our recent work has actually shown that this is all correct. It's not something that is arbitrary. It's not something that is just a mathematical operation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it works through nine dimensions, but it's of no relevance because we've been able to show quite separately, and this is pre-publication, so to say, that the scores, when we look at protons, electrons, and neutrons, and we add in these quarks to make stability and symmetry, in other words, to make a real world, mm -hmm. those figures exactly equal the figures that we find in the Large Hadron Collider. Of course, you've got to do some mathematics there, make them into, you know, you make the electron into one. You, so to say, normalize it, you naturalize it. But when you do these figures, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. They all work out equal. So what, what you're saying is that the uh, model that you've constructed that involves this mysterious quantity you call Gimel, which in prior interviews you've equated potentially with consciousness, uh, works out mathematically uh, very much the same way that conventional physics works out uh, using the Large Hadron Collider for empirical verification. Uh, however, your model has the uh, potential to incorporate consciousness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you see, if we use the term consciousness instead of Gimel, it's bad enough that we're talking about Gimel for a lot of physicists. Mm -hmm. And then they look at it and they can look at the mathematics and see we are correct. And, you know, the ultimate endpoint of science, of proof, is mathematics in mm -hmm. that way. And we've discussed how mathematics actually, to us, is part of the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. It's not just an operation. We have discussed how you would consider yourself a Pythagorean. In, 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 in that, that kind of context, yes. indeed. So you look at it, and a lot of uh, extensions of Pythagorean work works within our model as well, mm -hmm. as well as the work of Pierre de Fermat with Fermat's last theorem. But that's complex. Let's mm. not get there. But the point about it is suddenly we're dealing with a nine-dimensional reality with yeah. conundrums that work, with rotations. Mm -hmm. I sometimes use the framework of the ballerina who is busy spinning and the dress is really sticking out. Mm -hmm. And that edge, one of our 
recent findings is we think this edge is associated with that term angular momentum that I spoke about. Yeah. And it might be that that consciousness, maybe that gimel, is busy rotating on those edges and incorporating in the dimensions of time and the dimensions of space. So here's the ballerina or maybe the tornado going higher and higher and getting broader and broader, which is why we can't see it in 3S1T. We're tiny at mm -hmm. that little point yep. and trying to imagine outwards. Mm -hmm. And so here's dark matter and dark energy. And we're throwing out, could that be consciousness? Mm -hmm. A real speculation. Mm -hmm. Well... I guess it would be fair to say that your nine-dimensional model is, uh, in some respects, akin to many higher dimensional models that now exist in superstring theory, membrane theory, the klein kaluza model of five dimensions. And uh, I know my friends uh, Russell Targ and Elizabeth Rauscher have an eight-dimensional right. model. All of those models um, incorporate higher dimensions in one way or another. True. And it's good that there are these different models mm -hmm. because at least people begin to realize, hold on, we're not just talking about 3S1T, that's yeah. three dimensions of space and moment of time. It's only one difference. The difference is our model, with due respect, works and can dem be demonstrated mathematically and demonstrated objectively as correlating with the Large Hadron Collider. Mm -hmm. So it's not a case of saying eight dimensions. I've got great respect for the Tar Grasha work and or string theory with 10 or 11 or 26 or whatever number you yeah. want because they're all these different components. Mm -hmm. And it's not a case of saying membranes folding or uh, any curlings. We are talking about rotations which extend outwards. And if we can apply this model to cosmology, mm -hmm. suddenly we are saying that the laws of nature are no longer weird, are no longer queer, are no longer inappropriate. Mm -hmm. The laws of nature, same laws exist throughout everything, cosmological, macroscopic, and quantal. Mm -hmm. And this is what our discussion is all about now. Mm -hmm. So your model would suggest that this mysterious dark matter uh, does it need to exist the way uh, the uh, cosmologists currently uh, believe? Well, our model says that if you take into account this gimel, mm -hmm. this, if you want this consciousness, or maybe consciousness, yeah. this extra third substance, mm -hmm. this massless, energyless yeah. thing, we know that it correlates with the atom and with the protons, electrons, and neutrons, mm -hmm. and at a lower level with the quarks. Yeah. You take that into account at the atomic level. If you look at the ratio of gimel to what we call true units, mm -hmm. now gimel is contained within the mass and energy of these electrons, protons, neutrons, quarks. Every and particle. Every particle and producing an atom, and that makes the atom stable. And this we call true units, mm -hmm. triadic rotational, they're rotating units of equivalence. Yep. And we make the electron equal to one mm -hmm. in terms of the mass energy equivalence there. And we know that if we do this, we take that ratio of what is the ratio of the gimel to this whole two unit component. Yes. And what is the ratio in the cosmos of that? Mm -hmm. And by far the most productive um, element in the cosmos is hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Hydrogen is everywhere. Yes. It's most of it, but it's tiny, tiny. So when you take the mass of the hydrogen, it doesn't quite work out as profoundly big for the whole cosmos. Right. And so you take the one that's coming second, helium, and you put in the right proportions. And after helium comes oxygen, and you have nitrogen, and you have neon. And fortunately, you can take into account the exact proportions, because we can calculate it, of gimel in each one of these elements. Mm -hmm. And you take those ratios in terms of their mass equivalence, and you look at this in terms of two units. And then you just look at 
the cosmological data of the proportion of dark energy plus dark matter, and you've got to make these into volumes because everything is volumetric, to the whole cosmology. Mm -hmm. And I said, what would this be if Gimel was linked up with dark energy and dark matter? Let's make it a 2% equivalence, at least less than 2%. This is a ridiculously fine figure because a lot of the calculations of dark matter and dark energy sometimes go out 4.8%. Mm -hmm. And I said, if we can find it's within 2%, yeah. we will know that likely Gimel is in some kind of way in union with all these components of the dark matter and the dark energy. Mm -hmm. So guess what? It worked out. Not only did it work out, uh -huh. it wasn't within 2%. It was within 1 in 1,250. Mm -hmm. It was P less than 001. So Amazing. Are you suggesting that Gimel is the dark matter and dark energy or that it is associated with, tethered to in some way, the dark matter and Wonderful dark energy. Wonderful question. We don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. And I waver in my own mind. Sometimes I think maybe the gimel is the dark matter and the dark energy. And sometimes I think maybe it's just in union. Mm -hmm. And Ed Close feels the same. Yeah. I think he feels more closely that maybe it is the dark matter and the dark energy. I'm not sure. Because earlier we pointed out, and I think you, you agreed with me, that dark matter and dark energy is hypothesized to have, obviously, mass and energy, and Gimel has neither. Quite right. And this is why I've wavered yeah. and thought, well, if it's in union with all these subatomic particles, mm -hmm. it must be in union with dark matter and dark energy mm -hmm. and not the dark matter and dark energy. The only problem is one of definition. Yeah. So we took this one step further. Mm -hmm. And we said, hold on. Maybe, just maybe, the site of the dark matter and the dark energy is in the atom. Mm -hmm. Now, this sounded crazy. Because you've seen 95.1% of the cosmos is dark matter and dark energy. Therefore, only 4.9% of the cosmos is that mass energy that we know of, for example, in the atom. Mm -hmm. So how can you fit? You'd really have to squash the dark matter and the dark energy into the atom for it to work. Yeah. So the question was, how could this be done? Well, suddenly, when you do the ratios... This time, you take dark matter and you say, well, let's see if it links up with the proton and the neutron, you know, these strong forces, mm -hmm. uh, the dark matter being close to that. And let's look at that ratio compared with the electron and the dark energy there. And we take that ratio and we compare it with the gimel in the protons and the neutrons compared with the gimel in the electrons. Mm -hmm. And again, I've mentioned these variations in terms of some of the calculations of dark matter and dark energy are pretty close to up to 5%. Mm -hmm. So we said, well, if we could get within 5% here, this would be amazing. In fact, we got to 1 in about 40. We got to roughly about 2.3%. Variation mm -hmm. or difference. Yep. So suddenly, one says, no, it's not possible. How can you squash dark matter and dark energy into an atom with 0.9%? Be because we already know how much mass is in each atom. Yeah. But it is possible. Because you'll remember we're not dealing with 3S1T. Mm -hmm. That's just our physical universe. Yeah. And this is why people have missed out and not realized that dark matter and dark energy is there. It is also rotating vortical. We know that. We know that this is a whole dynamic. And the likelihood is just like Gimel. It is rotating like that ballerina maybe, maybe like that mm -hmm. tornado where it's expanding outwards through a nine-dimensional model. Mm -hmm. And there is some supporting data supporting the idea of dark matter and dark energy, therefore fitting into the atom, but in an atom that we don't recognize as an atom, not 
just 3S1T, mm -hmm. but in this whole yeah. nine-dimensional Because everybody is a grade school student would learn the model of the atom like a miniature solar system yeah. in, in three dimensions. And a wonderful parallel there, Jeff, mm -hmm. because you've got your model of the solar system. You've got your ideas of your rotation already. Yeah. You've got, we know that the Earth is busy rotating. We know that everything is busy rotating. And we know we are sitting there like in the central core, mm -hmm. that our inertia, our, what we think at that atomic level is mm -hmm. probably the mass. This is, we're not feeling our rotation mm -hmm. because everything else is rotating and we are rotating right. exactly with it. So, if I could summarize, what you're saying is that uh, these mysteries these weirdnesses that show up in cosmology and in quantum physics, if we begin to think of the universe as multidimensional, nine-dimensional, and we begin to add consciousness as, as a uh, part of the universe that has to be accounted for uh, in physical terms even, then the uh, paradoxes can be resolved. We have a, a whole different vision of what our universe is like. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, Vernon Neppy, this has been an enlightening and stimulating conversation. Thank you for being with me. Thank you, Jeff, for asking such wonderful questions and providing some excellent answers. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for being with us.